This morning's lesson will be as fundamental as I know how to make it on the subject we're dealing with because it uh, permeates all of our life on earth as Christians and our approach to the Word of God. And it's simply set before you in the form of this question. What is involved in obedience to God? What is involved in obedience to God? Now we hear about the importance of obeying God, of obedience to God all the time. But I don't know that we stop and consider just how to break that down and see exactly what is meant. We all say that, yes, you must obey God. If you're a child of God and teaching the gospel, you know that. So let me go into the answer of this, and I will begin with this introductory portion. Because even occasional readers of the scriptures soon become aware that the Bible abounds with passages emphasizing the obligation of everyone who are responsible to him for their actions to submit to the will of the Lord as a condition precedent to salvation. Paul, the greatest of the apostles, warned that the Creator will render vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 8 and 9. During His earthly ministry, our Lord said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Matthew seven twenty one. And to this, Jesus later added, and why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Luke 6 and verse 46. There was a point in his earthly ministry that certain Jews exhibited an interest in him and what he was teaching. Yet he perceived in them through their own evidence a shallowness of conviction and because of this, here's what he said to them. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. Now all those scriptures I think most everyone here are quite familiar with. And yet they say a lot more sometimes than we realize. There are some questions that I want to ask now that will help us to see even further the answer to what is involved in obedience to God. First of all, from this last reading in John 8, 31 and 32, what was the very nature of the truth which he spoke? Did he, our Lord, intend to convey the idea that the blessings that he, was, that he would bestow upon them was dependent on their conformity to the gospel of Christ, which is the means whereby salvation is extended to man? And, of course, the scriptures then promise the same, Romans chapter 1, verses 13 through 16 or 17. So... What does it mean to O-B-E-Y, obey God? Does one obey God who ignorantly, that's without knowledge, or otherwise substitutes human reasons for divine ones when we approach Him? And we would do well to remember that the three great religions that are revealed in the Bible as God unfolds a scheme of redemption down through time, the patriarchal age and its religion, the law of Moses for the Jews and the religion that it had, and then, of course, the New Testament and the religion of Christ for us, the perfect law of liberty. We must understand that those were ways men who lived during those times approached God. 
Today we approach God through the teachings of the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25, the New Testament. Now, many, many in the denominational world, and some, I'm sad to say, even in the church, think that you can handle the scriptures that way. And remember, the scriptures are given to us so we'll know the mind of God. And that we will follow in this life what he teaches for us to do. So the scriptures teach concerning what I just said about the denominational world and certain brethren. That those who do so, approach things in that loose way, are wrong. Not only wrong, but I would underscore they're seriously wrong. They are tragically wrong when they advocate this view. And the consequences are disastrous and eternally destructive to the souls of those who accept and who follow these dangerous doctrines. So I want to point out to you that there are three, three requisites to obedience. How can I be sure I've truly obeyed whatever it is that God's commanded me to do? Any one of these requisites, when omitted, renders the other two invalid. You'll recognize that I use these quite often when I'm referring to obeying God. But I wanted to go through this to emphasize for your own benefit in your daily living, in your practicing of the truth of obeying God, so you can analyze it and think for yourself on the matter. The first requisite is that we must do what the Lord said. We must do, it's imperative, can't get around it, with God. Be pleasing to Him. We must do what? What He said. The second one of these is that we must do what the Lord said in the way and the manner in which the Lord said do it. The way and the manner. Do what he said in the way and the manner. And then the third requisite is that we must do what the Lord said do in the way and the manner in which he said do it. For the reason, or reasons as the case may be, that the Lord said do it. Now I know you all have heard me say that, but I want you to think about it this this is dealing strongly with that and developing a whole lesson out of it. I think we can illustrate it in this way, and I think it's a very simple illustration to show those requisites as they would be applied. First, were the Lord to command us to go west, and we go east, we've disobeyed him. Were he to bid us to go west to work in the fields and we go west and work in a factory, we have disobeyed him. Were our Lord to tell us to go west and work in the fields to earn money, to buy a house in which to live, and we go west and work in the fields to earn money with which to purchase an automobile, we have disobeyed him. And I hope you see then in those three, those three requisites applied to a very simple illustration because we're wanting to know what is involved that I can know in my mind that I have fully obeyed whatever commandment it is that God has given me. So that brings us back to these two words, to obey. To obey is to follow the commands of another. Now, you can look at any dictionary you want to. Try out Webster's Eucalyptic Dictionary or whatever you want to, and you'll find that definition. To obey is to follow the commands of another. Does this begin to dawn on you why it's so ridiculous that most of those in the denominational world will try to get around obeying God? It's inherent in our very approach to God, approach to His Word, the study of His Word, and putting into practice the will of God in our lives. So we thus obey God only, and underscore that word only, when we do what He says in the way or the manner He designates 
and for the reason or reasons he specifies. Here's the point. Any other action on our part in such a situation is not obedience, but disobedience, and involves not submission on our part to his will, but we're actually substituting our own human will for his divine will. And I simply call again to your memory a very simple passage of scripture that we're all familiar with, and that's the worship of Cain and Abel. All you have to do is realize God told them what to do. God had commanded them. Abel's sacrifice, Hebrews 11 and 4, was acceptable. Cain's was not. But Cain erected an altar, so did Abel. Cain offered a sacrifice on that altar, so did Abel. Where was the problem? Cain offered what God did not command him to offer. Thus, though he did some things right, since he didn't do all of it, he did not fully obey God's commandments and it was not acceptable. I think some people in the church think, because they still think if I can get the, the scales of justice, so to speak, to weigh, get enough on this side to weigh down this side representing going to heaven, then the other side can have a lot of stuff in it that really is not right, but I've got more here, and therefore I'm going to heaven. Well, it's not a meritorious thing. And it is not. I do most of it, and it's all right. We must come to an understanding that obligatory matters must be done. There's no escaping them, whether it has to do with becoming a Christian or being faithful in the Lord's church. For we prove our faithfulness to God by fully obeying Him. We prove our love to God and the things of God by fully obeying Him. So you see how all of this involves the whole of a man to obey Him when we do these things. Now the conditions that are essential to salvation that are revealed on the pages of the New Testament are simple. They're clear. I think they're unmistakable. For one who reads without prejudice, who one approaches the Bible because it's the way you learn God's will for your life. So in order to become a Christian, one must not only have proper faith in God, Christ, the gospel system, the Bible, and so forth, formed in him, but he must exercise that faith. I think therein is one of the problems that we see, exercising faith our confidence in God and his way of salvation in our lives. So we must exercise faith in the Lord and his word. And that's what we have said in Hebrews 11 and verse 6 and Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Then the next step in the great plan of salvation revealed on the pages of the Bible is repent. Repent of what? Repent of one's sins, Luke 13, 3, Acts 17, 30. To repent is to break down our old stubborn wills. It's the seed of all sin and rebellion against God. Turn our life from living one way to living another. It's the Lord's will that matters now, not what I want to do and what I like. We only have a few years on this earth and none of us know how many we have. I used to preach this when I was 18, 19, and 20. And I had, and when I stood back in those days, I had no more knowledge I would live another day than I do today. And so it's important to understand that we use the time God's allotted us because it's the day of salvation. And now is the accepted time to do God's will. You just don't know when this life's going to end, but it will. We're to confess our faith in Christ, Romans 10, 10. And we're to be baptized into Christ by the authority of the Lord in water and to, uh, in order to, for the remission of sins. Acts 2, verse 38, and 1 Peter 3, and verse 21. Now those who from the heart thus do are saved from past sins. That is, the sins we originally committed that separated us from God. And they're called alien sins because they alienated us from God. And when we obey the gospel fully, then we're added to the Lord, that is, to his church, 
by the Lord himself, Mark 16, 15, and 16, and Acts chapter 2, 38 through 47. It is that church that he built, Matthew 16, 18, wherein he's located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, Ephesians 1, 3. It is the church of which Paul and Peter and every other Christian of the first century of which you read in the New Testament were members. So in, it is in this fashion that one becomes a Christian. Not some hyphenated Christian, but a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. A member of the blood-bought body of Christ. Because Christ, when you obeyed the gospel, added you to the church. Acts 11, 26, 1 Peter 4, 16, Acts 2, 47. A member then of the body of Christ. Ephesians 5, or 1 rather, verses 19 through 21. And that person who does such a thing is promised something. That person is promised eternal life with God. 1 John 2, 25. Now Luke, of course, inspired historian of the early church, has shown us some things about these Christians that I just talked about who fully obeyed the gospel to become Christians. He's shown us that those who thus did met regularly on the first day of the week for worship, Acts 20 and verse 7. That was a new thing in those days. Those devout Jews, and that's what they're called by Luke in Acts 2, who first heard the gospel the day the church started, had to change their view about days. And I must say the first day of the week is not like the seventh day of the week, the Sabbath under the law of Moses. That whole day itself was set apart. But on the matter of the first day of the week in which Christians assemble, certain things on that day are set apart, not the whole day. And so certain things are authorized to be done on that day in the assembly of the saints in the way of worshiping him. But that doesn't compare to the seventh day under the law of Moses, the Sabbath. The Sabbath. If you go back and read in the 19th century, it was, and even up in the early part of the 20th century, you see denominational people constantly referring to Sunday, the first day of the week, as the Christian Sabbath. It never was, and the Bible doesn't refer to it as that way. And these Jews who obeyed the gospel had to learn that they had to take a different view of the seventh day of the week than they once did under the law of Moses. And now they have to take a different view of the first day of the week and what's done on that day. And in that assembly, we're to sing the praises of God and that's all we do is sing because we have no authority to use mechanical instruments of music or any other kind of music other than singing. We're to teach the Word of God. We're to pray as we did this morning. We're to, in the week before that assembly, plan and purpose as we've been prospered to give of our means and the contribution to do the work of the church. And the fifth act of worship in that assembly is communing with God in the Observance of the Lord's Supper, whereby we show forth the Lord's death till he come again. Acts 2, 42 and 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Acts 20 and verse 7 and so on. The, this is how simple, and I hope it's coming across. This is how simple, primitive, pure New Testament Christianity is. When it comes to becoming a Christian and in the worship of the blood-bought body of Christ. I think those who've lived the Christian life a long time know that it's all these other days in between that you have many times difficulty because you're determined on each one of those days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, to be sure you're living like the New Testament says regarding your family, regarding the people you work with, regarding your neighbors around you, and so on. Now, I think it should be observed that I've noted that there are four steps regarding the matter of having once believed in Christ. Four more steps, repentance, confession, and baptism in water for the remission of sins. As are, and these are precedent to salvation. One salvation is an alien sinner from past, and I, we often say alien sins. For some time there have been a great many people in the church and the great majority of the denominational world who have no serious objection 
to the first three of these, requ of these requisites. But when it comes to baptism, we've got a problem. They understand if one's going to follow something, we've got to believe in it. They understand the importance of turning from one way and following that way. And that you're willing, if you're going to turn, to confess, well, I'm going this direction and here's where I'm going. But they have a problem when it comes to the matter of baptism. In Acts 2, verse 38, the day the church started, people who were pricked in their heart were brought to believe in Christ by the word preached, were told to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. American standard is unto, which means in order to reach a given end. That end here is the remission of forgiveness of sins, Acts 2, verse 38. It also puts one into Christ, Romans 6, 3, and 4. And it is the consummating act in God's plan to save one from sins, Mark 16, 15, and 16, and again, 1 Peter 3, 21. Now, remember back there earlier, a very common scripture. In fact, Ken referred to it this past Wednesday night. I don't know how many times over the years I've referred to it and every other faithful gospel preacher. Our Savior said, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, John 8, 32. Well, the clear and obvious import is that the only way accountable persons may escape the bondage of sin is by and through obedience to the truth. But if it is possible to obtain full and complete pardon from sin by disregarding truth and following error, which is contrary to and in contradistinction to the truth, does this not mean that error is as fully effective in producing salvation as our Lord's truth? And we should value error on a par with the truth of the gospel. In which case, is it not just as well to know error as it is to know the truth? And really we said there's not any difference in them. And I say all of that, no difference in error and truth. And we can obtain freedom from sin by obeying error as well as obeying the truth. One would be as valuable as the other. Jesus said that only those who do his will shall enjoy the benefits and the blessings of the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 7 verse 21. Now, do those who not only do not conform to his will, but who actually oppose it, publicly so, and in writing, and in every other way, and who urge others to disregard it, do they qualify for all the blessings that it offers? Then truth has no advantage over error, if that's the case. And falsehood is equally acceptable in producing deliverance from the power and presence of sin. Now, this conclusion necessarily follows from the premises which we are asked to embrace. And it just won't work. People don't realize when they do that what they're advocating or the implications rising therefrom. The scriptures make it exceedingly clear the salvation on the one hand and damnation, eternal damnation, separation from God and the devil's hell on the other are matters dependent on whether one obeys or disobeys God. We started off when the Lord comes again in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Second Thessalonians 1, 7 and 9. Only when we, and this is the reason for this sermon, holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy, holy yield our wills to the Lord. Only do what 
he said, only when we do what he said do in the way he said do it. And for the reason, or reasons as the case may be, that he said to do it. Do we obey him? And thereby qualify on his terms for the salvation he offers. The reason for religious dissension and diversion is not because of the vagueness or ambiguity or obscurity of teaching in the scriptures. I think this sermon this morning, for anybody that really listens, knows that. The way is so plain, as the Old Testament scripture says, that wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. Isaiah 35 and verse 8. And if a man, meaning mankind, if a person, if a human being, who's accountable to God for his life, will do his will, he shall know the teaching. John 7, 17. That is a peculiar situation with the commands of God. Notice if you do what he says, you will know his will. You see, the Bible set up in such a way as that it was meant to be incorporated into your life as it guides and leads you as you do what he said. Wasted it for the reason or reason he said it. Built upon that, you're able to know more. That's one reason some people don't know more. They study, but they don't study with the intent to obey fully God's commandments, and so they don't understand a lot of other things. So the problem is not properly attributable to any difficulty in the divine relation, but results from a deep-seated unwillingness and stubbornness on the part of many people to bring their wills into subjection to the will of God, to obey Him from the heart. Our obligation to all lost people, people lost in sin, all of those who are headed for hell because they haven't been forgiven is a great one. And the Lord has placed that obligation on the church in what we know is the great commission of going ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. It is neither narrow nor sectarian to urge that in order to enjoy the approval of our Lord here on this earth and the great bliss of heaven hereafter, that's essential, it's imperative, it is a must that we abide in his teachings and that means we must obey him, we must do his will. Matthew 7, 9, 2 John 9. We do not serve the cause of the Savior nor do we contribute to the well-being of those who are in error and need to hear the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, and especially on the importance of obedience. By minimizing then the importance of a full and faithful response to whatever the commandments of the Lord are. The church needs that. If every member of the church had that, there wouldn't be an apostasy going on. There wouldn't be a problem that couldn't be corrected. And I think as I close the lesson that one of the best things I can say, because we all make mistakes, the best of us do. That's part of the way that we keep each other faithful is that we're constantly mindful of, first of all, our own individual lives and the lives of our brethren. And wherein we would go wrong, we have, first of all, our own knowledge of the truth that convicts us of our sins, but then our brethren who are willing to restore us when we fall away. So ask yourself the question, have I fully obeyed the commandments of God to become a Christian? And am I fully obeying Christ concerning living the Christian life in his church to which he added us when we were baptized for the remission of our sins? As a child of God, if you have sinned, then you need to renew your love for Christ in repenting of those sins. Return to him in full repentance, confessing your sins and praying God for forgiveness. If you're therefore subject to the great will of heaven, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.